The Choco Rainforest in Colombia, Panama, and Ecuador is likely the rainiest rainforest on Earth, with some areas possibly receiving up to 12.8 meters or 42 feet per year on average. The port of Buenaventura, Colombia, has more than 10 times the annual rainfall of London and three times the annual rainfall of Manaus in the heart of the Amazon. This inhospitable environment has had a profound impact on the history of South America. The Choco may not be the wettest place on Earth. That title may belong to Meghalaya in northeast India, where the Indian monsoon is most powerful. But since this area has a significant dry season, it's not the wettest rainforest on Earth. Another close contender is Kauai in the Hawaiian Islands, where Pacific trade winds take an unobstructed path 3,000 kilometers across the ocean before rising up these high volcanic slopes. Regardless, rainfall in the Choco is extraordinary and has had a strong influence on other geographic patterns. But first of all, what is the Choco rainforest and why is rainfall here so exceptional? Well. The Choco rainforest is distinct from the Amazon, separated by the towering Andes Mountains, and just around the corner is the Sechura Desert, one of the driest places on Earth, and the driest desert this close to the equator. That makes Ecuador's Pacific coast a zone of drastic transition between some of the wettest and driest places on the planet. Strange as it might seem, the extreme dryness of this desert is actually linked to the heavy rainfall in the Choco rainforest. How is that possible? Well, if you've taken a high school earth science class, you've probably seen this diagram of climate on an idealized earth. Intense heating at the equator forces air to rise, and as it rises, it cools. The water vapor then condenses as a result, producing intense rainfall. This area of intense rainfall is known as the Intertropical Convergence Zone, or ITCZ. The air that rises here then sinks over the adjacent subtropics. Where the air sinks, it caps the convection necessary for rainfall, leading to dry and stable conditions. This air then rushes back toward the equator in the form of trade winds. Our actual planet, however, deviates wildly from this simple diagram. Because this is a heat-driven process, it's heavily influenced by seasons, especially over large continents where seasons are more drastic. The intertropical convergence zone moves toward the hotter hemisphere as it experiences its summer season, because as far as the atmosphere is concerned, the hot region has moved. So in January, it swings south to Australia, and in July, it swings up to China, for instance. All that dry, sinking air moves too, and much of it actually sinks in specific high-pressure systems over the ocean, particularly over cooler eastern ocean margins along the western sides of continents. This is probably a good thing because altogether it means we have smaller deserts and a more even distribution of tropical rainfall. But the intertropical convergence zone doesn't behave normally on South America's Pacific coast. Here, the chilly Humboldt current and upwelling of cold, deep water is supercharged because southerly winds are channeled and strengthened by the Andes. The convergence zone isn't going to move toward this cold water, so it stays locked on Colombia's Pacific coast for much of the year. And due to the Coriolis force, trade winds that cross the equator curve into westerlies, slamming right up against the western mountain slopes. The consequence of all this is that the area of intense rainfall stays in a concentrated band over the Choco. And there is one parallel to this situation. The Benguela current in the South Atlantic produces a similar effect in Africa. A dry coastal belt stretches all the way north to Luanda, Angola, and a super wet rainforest is found to the north, between the Niger and Congo River. In fact, the volcanic island of Bioko is another contender for the highest rainfall on Earth. The Choco's consistent rainfall supports an ecosystem filled to the brim with novelty. Take for instance the bizarre long-waddled umbrella bird. 
This forest is one of the most biologically diverse regions in the world, supporting at least 50 bird species found nowhere else and many more which are rarely found elsewhere. Endemic species include Geoffrey's tamarind and the choco toucan, along with many others. Boa constrictors share the trees with dozens of colorful birds and primates. As a result of the heavy rain, the landscape is dissected by rivers and mangroves. It's no surprise, then, that the two apex predators of this ecosystem are competent in the water and on land. But a far more dangerous animal, pound for pound, is this golden dart frog, the most poisonous animal on our planet and the largest species of poison dart frog. Its poison has been of critical importance to the indigenous people of this region, who use its toxins to hunt for animals like tapir and red brocket. Many people associate this practice with Amazonian tribes, but in fact, they more often used plant-derived poisons called curare for their darts. For the most part, the use of poison dart frogs for hunting is a practice endemic to the choco. For centuries, the indigenous people of this region have utilized the unconventional resources of their home, even those below ground. Gold and platinum are abundant beneath the jungle soil, and they were of great importance to pre-Columbian societies like the Toledo and Tomeco. Gold and platinum never corrode even beneath tropical rain. Through these ornaments, the legacy of their ancestors could echo through the ages. And their legacy certainly did last, because today it's thought they were the first people to work with platinum, sometime between 600 BC and 200 AD. They lived in houses very similar to those of Micronesia, with steep pitched roofs to shed heavy rain and a raised platform to avoid flooding. And they traded with people of the high mountains, providing the mountain societies with gold in exchange for obsidian, critical for weapons and tools. In a later era, the precious metals of this coastline lured the Spanish, but disease was in the air. The shore was covered in mangrove thickets, crocodiles swam the rivers, and predators lurked in the forest. The Spanish forced indigenous people and African slaves to work the mines. But these laborers repeatedly escaped and successfully rebelled against the outnumbered Spanish, disappearing into the thick rainforest and maintaining their freedom. This region became one of the Americas' largest maroon colonies, a community built by escaped slaves who forged their own identity in a new environment. The other maroon colonies were conspicuously located in very high rainfall regions like the Mosquito Coast or wetlands like the Dismal Swamp, places where thick forests and difficult terrain kept law enforcement at an arm's length. Today, that history is reflected in the demographics of Colombia, with the Pacific side being overwhelmingly Afro-Colombian. It's clear that unusual geography can be seen as a curse by some, and an opportunity by others. As always, the sources for this video are in the description. Thanks for watching. If you find these topics interesting, consider subscribing. There will be many more to come.